And Major Mansman said, sit down. And there were two guys, as I recall, two guys in gray suits, civilian clothes, which was fairly unusual. Um, and uh, Major Mansman said, watch this, and turned on the film projector. And I watched the screen, and there was the launch from a day or two before at, at, uh, at Big Sur. It was quite exciting because of the length of the, of the telescope as the Atlas missile entered the frame we could see the the whole third stage which is which has two uh, rocket nozzles like this and one in the center a gimbaled one in the center fill in our frame from a hundred and oh, about 160 miles that was pretty exciting optics we watched that stage burn out we watched the second stage burn out we watched the third stage burn out and into the frame came something else it flew into the frame like this and it shot a beam of light at the warhead, which is represented by my thumb here. Now, remember, all this stuff is flying at several thousand miles an hour. So this thing fires a beam of light at the warhead, hits it, and then this thing flies up like this. Meanwhile, we're all going like this, fires another beam of light, goes around like this, we're going like this, fires another beam of light, goes down like this, fires another beam of light, and then flies out the way it came in. And the warhead tumbles out of, the, out of space. Now, when the lights came on, Major Mansman turned around and looked at me and said, were you guys screwing around up there? And I said, no, sir. And he said, what was that? And I said, it looks to me like we got a UFO. He said, what happened is this. They took the film and they spooled off the part that had the UFO on it and they took a pair of scissors and cut it off. They put that on a separate reel, they put it in their briefcase, they handed Major Mansman back the rest of the film and said, here, I don't need to remind you, Major Mansman, of the, of the uh, severity of a security breach. We'll consider this uh, incident closed. Mercury astronaut Gordon Cooper was the last American astronaut to go up in space alone. He orbited the planet 22 times. While stationed at Edwards Air Force Base in the early 1950s, Cooper was part of an event that has never been explained. I was having some cameramen film the installation of a precision landing facility they were putting in right on the edge of the dry lake. And this saucer flew right over him and put down three little gear and landed out on the dry lake bed. And they went out picked up their cameras and moved on out toward him filming. And he lifted off, put the gear back in the well, and climbed out at a very high rate of speed and disappeared. And by the time they got back with the developed film, I was on the higher and higher and higher level officer talking to me. Finally with the colonel telling me to, uh, you know, when the film arrived at my desk to put it in the carrier pouch, there would be a courier there at my office by that time already, and, and they'd arrange for him to fly in our base airplane back to Washington with these films, and uh, do not run prints, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Did you watch the film? We didn't have a chance to run it. I had a chance to hold it up to the window and look at it. It was certainly a good film. Did you ever keep in touch with anybody about it or discuss it? How would I keep in touch with anybody about it? There's no way within the military or within the government of keeping track of something that is classified unless you're directly involved in it, and I was not. We have not been hiding anything. The investigations have been made public. The explanations of those where there is a clear explanation have been made public. The hearing this morning was public for just that reason. Uh, in those cases where for lack of data or lack of a convincing hypothesis, the citing has been kept in the unidentified category, we've been perfectly willing to say that too.
This boy come running in and say, Mr. Greenwood, Mr. Greenwood, there's these things in the sky, there's these things in the sky. We looked up and we just saw this saucer type thing taking off. It wasn't a plane, it wasn't a balloon, it was nothing like that. A lot of the kids took off towards where it seemed to go. All the students were just running all over the place. Uh, hysterical. And I just happened to be looking out the window, thinking how to fudge my science report. What I saw directly south was something that I'd never seen before. We were out playing sport on the oval. One of the kids yelled out, look, look up in the sky, you know, it's flying saucers. And, and I remember we all looked up and it really was a flying saucer. <laughs> I mean, from what you imagine, a flying saucer, it was a round silver disc. Um, and it, it seemed to be very low over the school and I remember kids screaming and running inside. The student who came in uh, was hysterical, leaned up against a sliding door, screaming there's a flying saucer in the oval. And of course everybody started to head towards the door and the teacher said, sit down, it's not recess yet, and a few minutes later the bell went off. Everyone started moving like a whole lot of zebras being terrified by crocodiles. I went where the herd went. Barbara Robbins was the chemistry teacher at the time. And she just grabbed a camera and started clicking. We weren't allowed to leave the school, at least I wasn't. My job was to walk up and down the corridors and make sure that all students were in their rooms. I was walking back from the West End. There was confrontation between Mr. Sambleby, Barbara Robbins, and a man I'd never seen before. I thought it was a police uniform, but it was just dark blue. It was demanded that she hand over, not the film, but the entire camera. John Callahan was the FAA division head in charge of evaluations and investigations at the time of the JAL flight. You have an airplane or a structure or a craft that's sitting outside that 747's window. It never entered my mind that it might really be a UFO until I saw the radar. Just after 6 p.m., Captain Kenju Terauchi and a crew of two enter Alaska airspace for the second leg of their journey, heading for Anchorage. At the helm, Captain Terauchi has nearly 30 years in the cockpit. At 6.19 p.m., the crew sees something on the radar. Unable to see another plane outside the window, they ask the control tower to identify it. Uh, we cannot identify the type, but we can see the uh, strobe lights. Military radar advises they are picking up intermittent primary target behind you. In trail, in trail, I say again. Callahan's division investigated the radar and cockpit recording from the JAL flight. Well, a blind man could see that there was another aircraft or craft of some type there because it shows up on radar. It had to be some type of a craft. Callahan asserts the pilot's eyewitness account is independently confirmed by radar. Everybody had that target on the radar somewhere along the line. When it was all done, and we went back to uh, Washington the next day, the uh, administrator had called down and uh, wanted to know uh, if, if uh, he had a problem or not. And my boss had told him, well, we took a video of it, and uh, it looks like there might have been something there. The uh, administrator, which was Ingen at the time, Admiral Ingen, 
He said, uh, well, have you got that video with you? Can you show me the video? And I said, yeah, and then, yeah, you just plug it in and play it. So we plugged it in for him. He started watching it, and after about five minutes, he told the staff, I canceled my, uh, he had a meeting with someone in 15 minutes. He says, first he said, I'll be late, and then next it was uh, cancel, and then uh, uh, I'm going to be here till this is over. So he watched the whole thing just over half an hour. A few minutes later, the admiral calls down and says, I set up a, uh, a briefing, bring all the stuff you have, bring everybody up there, and uh, give them whatever they want, and we want to get out of it, just let them do whatever they want to do with it. They brought in uh, three people from the FBI, three people from the CIA, and three people from Reagan's scientific uh, study team, and I don't know who the rest of the people were. But they were all excited. When they got done, they t actually swore all these other guys into uh, uh, that this never took place. We never had this meeting, and this was never recorded. They said they'd taken all this data, and I said, fine. Now, I had the original uh, video that uh, I took, and I had the, uh, the uh, pilot's uh, uh, report that came through, uh, the first report, and I had the FAA's uh, uh, first report that was all downstairs on my, uh, my table. They didn't ask for that, so I didn't give it to them. January 1981. Rumors are swirling around the Woodbridge Bentwaters Air Bases in eastern England after mysterious UFOs are sighted by the U.S. Air Force personnel stationed there. Many of them were, were some years into their tour of duty. These were highly trained witnesses. It's not as if they'd all just turned up there the night before. The military investigation that followed remains controversial to this day. Those who say they witnessed the UFOs believe the military was more interested in damage control than in finding the truth. What our government did in the name of secrecy to these individuals is absolutely shameful. According to these airmen, they soon became unwilling participants in a government cover-up. Initially, the investigation follows standard military procedure. Deputy Base Commander Charles Holt, a witness himself, begins debriefing the airmen who reported seeing the craft. I had no choice. I couldn't ignore it. There were so many witnesses and so many people at so many different places. John Burroughs, who witnessed the UFOs on both nights, says his interview is clear-cut. I took our statements, kind of looked at him, said it was really a wild thing, and there's really no explanation for what's going on, and that's how it was kind of left. Others, like Sergeant Jim Penniston, say that after their meeting with Halt, a long and disturbing process begins. Two weeks after his initial interview, Penniston is called for another debriefing. This time, it is with a high-ranking team of investigators, the OSI. The OSI is the Office of Special Investigations. It's, uh, how shall I say, the, the discreet police is one way to put it. And they are there to police the U.S. Air Force. And they can actually walk into the, an office of a general and, you know, even arrest him, if you like. That's how powerful they are. When Penniston enters the room, the mood is ominous. He begins to give a statement and offers the investigators sketches and notes of his encounter. Deputy Base Commander Charles Holt is also aware of covert activities going on at the base. I heard some stories that were substantiated by several people that a uh, plane load of people did come in a day or so later and did do a lot of investigating. Penniston and Holt claim they took pictures of the mysterious craft they encountered. But when the prints return from the base's photo lab, they are blank. The pictures are whited out, most of them. Um, I thought that was really uh, unusual. And I believe that the photos that I got were intentionally just whited out photographs. That's what I believe. Even Lieutenant Colonel Halt, the highest ranking eyewitness, believes he is being kept in the dark by the military. 